Hi, welcome to Happy Tales. I'm Cheryl Rosenthal, Education and Communications Coordinator at the Oshkosh Area Humane Society. And I'm Joni Geiger, Executive Director. And today our show is going to be a little bit on the serious side. Uh, we have a special guest with us mm -hmm. today, Joni. Uh, we have Dr. Christina Lehner with us, and she has a very unique clinic here in the Oshkosh area. Um, and so welcome, Dr. Christina, and thank you for being with us today. Thanks for having uh, me. And tell us, tell us about, about your clinic and, and what makes it unique. Sure, absolutely. Um, I have a really great clinic called Creature Comfort Clinic, and um, what I do is in-home care. And really, my special niche with in-home care is really caring for pets with debilitating diseases. Um, so hospice care, as well as sometimes in-home pet euthanasia when it's time. So. Okay. And, and I think euthanasia is, you know, that's kind of a subject that people go, oh, I don't want to talk about that, I don't want to think about it. But the truth is, is that we all love our pets, but we need to face the reality that our pets are, we're going to outlive our pets. And so I'm a great believer in quality of life up, right up until the end, not necessarily quantity. And so how does your clinic play a part in that? What are, what are some of the things that, first of all, I'd like to know, how long have you been doing this? Sure, sure. Well, I've been doing this for about two and a half years now. I've been a practicing vet for about four and a half years. And the way I started was I just really saw that there was a need for doing this, this type of service. Um, I started just working at a regular vet clinic and every once in a while we would have calls for doing a house call euthanasia. And I really saw how much it impacted families and really made a difference for the pets too. The pets right away are so much more yeah, comfortable absolutely. in their natural surroundings. And I really felt that the time was much more special and intimate. And I felt like we were able to create a very meaningful and gentle passage. And uh, that's really how Creature Comfort Clinic started. I have to tell you, I think this is really huge. I think this is big. This is very, you know, for anybody, obviously, who's probably watching this program, they love their pets, their family. They're, it, they're very, very important to them. Um, and the fact that you can provide that intimacy for them, um, I think is really, really cool. And it's, you know, because we all know, like sometimes just going to the vet can create some mm -hmm. stress right. for pets, that type of thing. It creates stress for us. Right. It's difficult anyways when you finally made that decision to let a pet yes. go. Um, so it's, it's very emotional. And I think having, um, having this, and I hate to even call it a service because it, because it's it's such a it's such a need. Right. Um, I think is extremely important for a lot of different individuals and people, and certainly for pets. Yeah, yeah. So, and it's very meaningful. I mean, it's always hard from my perspective to to do it as well as from the family's perspective, mm -hmm. but it really is quite meaningful, and I, that gives purpose to what you're doing. And um, just going through this process with my own pets, um, I really want to be sure. that type of person right. to help right. a family go through this. I know a number of years ago I had a, a large dog that was very ill and his time had come and I just couldn't bear the thought of having to load him up in the car and yes. drive him to the vet's office and it just, just thinking about it just was so stressful for me right. and to be able to have the veterinarian come to our home yeah. and we kind of had it planned out and it just, um, it, it just made a big difference for us. Um, it may not be for everybody, but for us in this particular situation, um, it, it's never easy, but this made it a little bit more comforting, uh, knowing that he was surrounded by all of us that loved him. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, so when a pet is terminally ill, what are some of the things that um, you look for or that you can do to provide hospice when you know I, I think people understand what hospice is for humans um, but what does hospice mean for uh, pets and pets uh, that have terminal illnesses aren't necessarily old pets right. uh, sometimes we can have young pets who have uh, illnesses that are shortening right. their lives so Absolutely. what do you what do you look for or what can you do well it really depends upon the situation but whenever I have a pet that um, has been newly diagnosed with a terminal illness or just even a very debilitating condition such as severe arthritis, okay, um, sure. we really are changing the focus to really working on improving the quality of the life. So it's, it's a shift in focus from being curative 
to what can we do to palliate. So in other words, to keep this pet comfortable, to make these remaining days much more um, comfortable for the pet, much more full for the pet, as well as for the family too. So it's really just a shift in focus. And that shift in focus can make all the difference with improving this pet's quality of life and really making this time much more. Um, can, can you give some examples? I mean, uh, like, do you administer pain medication? Do you have, you know, can you give some examples sure. of what you may sure. prescribe or yep. what you may yep. encourage a family to try to do to make that, yep. that pet's remaining days more sure. meaningful? Yep. <clears throat> so pain control is certainly, you know, when we think about um, end of life diseases, things like that, certainly pain is often part of that. So I absolutely work with families to tailor a plan that um, will really help to alleviate this pet's pain as much as we can. Um, and that really is an individual tailoring based upon what's going on, how the pet is responding and whatnot mm -hmm. else. Um, so certainly pain control is a big part of it. Um, a lot of times setting up the home is part of it too. You know, what can we do to... Uh, that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. So what can we do to make this pet... Um, so like stairs and all those right. other kinds of things that might... Yep. Okay. Easier and so for you're thinking around. those things. Okay. Right. Right. Maybe changing right. where the dog, you know, if the dog has to go outside <clears throat> and they've been taking them downstairs, maybe there's a patio door that we can use instead that right. entrances right into the yard. Absolutely. Um, adding more watering stations or yep. changing where you, you know, maybe adding a more comfortable bed, mm -hmm. you know, just helping people really see what are some of the things. I think we forget animals don't exhibit pain the same way that you and I do. Yes. And um, sometimes yeah, an can animal be can be in um, excruciating pain yes. and they'll still be walking around and, yep. you know, like me, if I stub my toe, I'm walking around going, ow, ow, ow. Uh, but animals don't do that. They're like, stiff upper lip, I'm fine. Yep. So. Well, they just love us so much, you know, and I think that their love for us overrides a lot of times mm -hmm. showing us signs of pains that, that we might recognize. Now, I would think that, you know, you would have to be a people person as well. I mean, because this is, you're seeing people sometimes in an emotional trauma where, yeah. where it's very emotional for people. And so I'm assuming that there's some counseling as well, even for the individuals, for the family, for the so that they can understand what's happening or or what's to come that type yeah. of thing so there definitely is there definitely is there's a lot of times where families are asking me advice you know what should I do with my children mm -hmm. how should I handle this sure. particular situation and whatnot so I certainly am not a certified counselor but it is important in my opinion just to listen to families sure. and just to give right. honest advice from experience that I've right. been through sure um, I am also attending a um, a conference this coming weekend and it's going to be on pet loss and becoming certified in dealing better sure, with mm -hmm. pet loss with families right. so well and I and there's other decisions you know like should the children be there who's going to be there should other pets be there <clears throat> are the other pets removed and then allowed to come back in I know that was some of the things that that happened with me and it was very important you know the decisions that we made um, made a difference down the road for us. And I, so. I, think, I think you're right as far as like listening. I think that is key in, in understanding because it may be different for one person versus another person. Um, so I, th I, I, I agree wholeheartedly. Cheryl and I have been, you know, we get asked, you know, occasionally, you know, like, when is the time? How do I know? And I would assume the same thing happens to you as well. And, yeah. and how do you respond to that? I mean. We really have to look at the pet in a number of different areas. So overall quality of life. So there isn't just one parameter. I certainly have a lot of families that say, oh, well, I've heard that I'll know by looking at their eyes or when their mm. tail doesn't wag or when they stop eating. And unfortunately, that just isn't always true. Um, sometimes that's true, but it isn't always true. So I really recommend going through a number of different parameters. Um, Normally, I'll go through a quality of life assessment with a family, and I actually do have one on my website with a, a link going to that. So cool. that's certainly <clears throat> something that's available. Um, but we look at things like: um, Are they eating well? Are they drinking well? Are they able to get around the home well? Are they having issues with that? What's their overall happiness? Are they wanting to engage with us, or are they really kind of slinking back into the corner mm -hmm. and wanting to be by themselves? Are they doing any playing? that type of thing? Yep, yep. Um, 
I've had a, and I, I know there isn't a right or wrong to this, but I've had some people say, I just want them to pass at home, right. like naturally in their sleep or something like that. <clears throat> and I, I'm, you know, and, and granted, this is my opinion, but that drives me crazy, you know, because it doesn't always work that way. I mean, you know, like you see this on TV where people just, oh, they just, and they close their eyes and they peacefully pass away. And very often that's not the case for animals. Yeah. or people for that matter you know they're struggling they're mm -hmm. you know and and so do you have any answer to something like that as far as like how you would share with a person like whether that's a good thing or a bad thing and obviously it's their decision mm -hmm. yeah well i mean i think we all wish that our pets would just gently pass in their sleep when they're ready that would really be mm -hmm. the best and the most peaceful and gentle for right. them and it really takes the decision away from us, which is a hard decision. But you're right, Joni, it just does not happen very often. And for families that do want that and really refuse to do anything else, a lot of times there's a lot of pain and a lot of suffering that the pet is right. going through. Right. So oftentimes natural death is not pretty to watch and it's just not gentle for, right. mm -hmm. for pets. Right. So that's really one of the first things that I'll talk to families about and we really just need to shift focus to what can we do to help our pet. Right. Mm -hmm. It's going to be hard to make that decision. And so it's really just shifting the focus to really looking at the pet, really looking at the quality of life, and just all being on the same page that we don't want our pets to go through that. And really, when I talk to families, by far most families don't want their pets to suffer. Sure. So we can all agree mm -hmm. upon that. Sure. How now. Oh, I'm sorry. I was just going to say this is a this is a partnership between you and your husband. Um, you, you this is your in-home clinic, yes. so to speak. In other yeah. words, and you go out and and so and we've met Nate. Nate's her husband, and um, he's also he's the guy that like if you're not around, he's he's yes. handling things. And so uh, tell me a little bit about that. I mean, obviously, I even you're around 24 7 or you're on call so to speak but yep. can't always be there so how does that work well um, so certainly my husband Nate he is a big part of of our business yeah. um, and so he does answer the phones when I'm not available and oftentimes the first person to answer the phone you really end up hearing about the pet mm -hmm. you know it's important for us to know what's going on so we can help and so he oftentimes if if I can't answer the phone he'll be the first person to hear that conversation and to try to offer appropriate right, right. advice. So he needs to know the right questions to ask yes. or you know because I'm sure there are there are sometimes because we're not veterinarians right. we don't always know well how soon should I have called you you yes. know like now I'm in a panic because now I think my pet is really suffering so now I need you to come. Mm -hmm. um, is that something you know so he has to kind of feel his way through that with the person that's he calling. He does. He find does. Out where where they're at. Yep. And we certainly have. I've helped with training him just as far as you know appropriate questions to ask. He's very familiar with the quality of life assessment, and so that certainly has allowed him to help with some of those mm -hmm. questions and well, to know and, when and it. You have, again, you have to be a people person, and you have to have not only compassion for the animals, yes. but compassion for that right. person Absolutely. on the other end of the phone who's not knowing what to do right and right not knowing whether or not they're doing the the right thing right yeah and i know we both look at this with the same heart which is how can we help you know pets and families because sure. it really is a partnership like what you said um and we really want to be there to help as much as we can and listen and so I feel like we can always promise that to everybody who calls. I certainly try to be there as a person who can either help you solely with your pet or work with your regular veterinarian. Oh, okay. um, I think that's important too and I think we need to probably bring this up is because obviously you know we have our own veterinarians and, and um, you know have a, a great relationship with vets so you're not you're not impeding on a service that no. they're providing. You're just providing something totally different from what they would do. Right, really, you know, an adjunct to the care that they're already providing. Right, right, so, because I think this is important to, to recognize that this is different than 
um, you know, taking your pet to the veterinarian yes. um, because obviously you're going to encourage that, you know. But if a person wants a different choice or a different way to do this, mm -hmm. and if your vet does not provide this service, then this is where your Yes. your expertise comes in. Yes, yep, okay. most definitely. Yep. Okay. Yep, so I, I really do get a lot of referrals from other veterinarians mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. I have great relationships with every vet. I, that's really my goal is to work alongside mm -hmm. of them. Sure. Um, and certainly just with offering after hours support as well as weekend support, that's something that a lot of veterinarians don't offer. Um, and even with the in-home care, for a regular veterinarian that has a regular clinic a lot of you vets can't, just can't yeah. offer that because right. it takes a lot more time, takes a lot more resources. So it's just a totally different thing. But I really work alongside yeah. vets. And I th yeah, yeah, I think that's important to, to recognize that it's a little bit different. Now, as far as, um, so you do hospice, you do end of life care, um, and then you know, the actual act of euthanasia itself. Um, a lot of people, this is sometimes a difficult um, uh, discussion to have, but but there there is a, a process that euthanasia, There's and there's different ways of, of obviously doing that. And um, so your your decision to do this, do you explain that to the, to, to the clients? Do you share with them what's going to happen? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, but I feel like that's so important just so that right. families know what to expect um, through the whole process. Sure. And you think about children too, that makes it even oh, more yeah. important just to make oh, sure yeah. that we're all on board yeah. with, with what's going to yeah. be happening. And that helps them make the decision whether they want their children to be present or or not. It or really not. does. It really does. You know, a lot of families, um, they kind of know ahead of time, but certainly there are situations where maybe they don't know and they are looking for guidance with that. Mm -hmm. So. This sounds, and I don't mean this in a bad way, but that it it can obviously be extremely um, emotional for people, but it also can be very beautiful. Yes. I mean, it, yes. it truly can. I mean, I've been present at some passings where it was truly um, a gift. Yes. It really was. So do you yes. want to share that a little bit? Yeah, I just think that that's you know such an important point that I think a lot of families don't realize. Oftentimes I'm crying alongside the family, but it really is, it can be a very beautiful, intimate moment. And when the process is done peacefully and gently, grieving is a lot easier as yeah. a family member. Yeah. And it's a lot easier on your pet. Yeah, <laughs> so, right, absolutely. Right. So the actual process always begins uh, with a sedative as well as two different pain relievers. And those are all mixed into one syringe. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes I'll use a baby needle and it just goes right underneath the skin. Sure. And so what this does is it alleviates pain, and that's so important. Nobody wants their pet's last moments to be right. painful moments. Right. Um, so it will alleviate the pain, and then the sedative helps to create a transition for your pet. So it's going to allow your pet to just gently fall asleep with you in a pain-free state. Mm -hmm. And then once they're in a nice, sleepy, relaxed state, and once your family's ready, then we would go ahead with the next step, which is the actual euthanasia. Right. Okay. Yeah. And you know, I I, I know this is, and I and I'll, I'll go back to this all the time. And I know this is difficult for people uh, mm -hmm. because nobody wants to let their pet go. Nobody wants to, and and you know, and probably being in the business that we're in, you know, obviously we're witness to it much more mm -hmm. frequently than than the average person, but. I, I can tell you on a personal level how important that is that that passing is peaceful. That is so incredibly important, I think, from a person's perspective, right. but you, obviously you, you for your want, pet. You know, you don't want that memory of your pet being writhing right. in pain. Right. Or, right. Right. So, so I think while it's a, a difficult subject, I think this is a you know for for everyone. I think it's an important one, and I think it is you know opening those doors right. and letting well, people and, know. And you need to think about it. You know, I mean, yeah. you don't have to dwell yes. on it. It's, it's kind of like for people when you plan your own funeral. You know, you take that burden away from your family uh, because you have those preparations all made. And I think having in-home euthanasia. I know for me, it just I found that very comforting, that I knew when it was going to happen, what to expect, and that my pet would have the best quality as far as passing over as possible. Yep. Um, and, and I think people, 
it's okay for you to take comfort in that. No, no one wants to make the decision to end an animal's life. Um, but if it's the difference between them being in excruciating pain for days or sometimes even weeks, um, if there's something that can be done, like you said, with the pain medication, different things, and then being able to peacefully let them go, it doesn't hurt any less, but on the other hand, it's there's a, a comfort in knowing that you did all that you could to make that passing peaceful. Yes, 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 most how did you How did you actually get into this, at, that this is something that you you wanted to do? Is it, where, where was your motivation for that? I think it just really goes back to having been through it myself right. and really just wanting to help families as much as I can and just seeing this as an area that is difficult to go through, right. you know, as a family member and right. as a pet, and what can I do to really help? Sure, sure. Now, yeah. is this also something, um, you know, some of the services, other services that you provide, um, it, we have a lot of uh, people in the community, maybe elderly people, people that are disabled, they're not able to mm -hmm. readily get their pet to the veterinarian on a regular basis. Are there, do you provide any of those services other than, you know, the hospice and the in-home uh, euthanasia? Yep, I most definitely will offer those services by request. It, it's something where I really try to work alongside vet clinics, so I never want to have a competition. But there are certain situations where, you're right, maybe it's a really large dog that just can't get into the vet. Right. Maybe it's an elderly uh, owner mm -hmm. who can't take their pet in. And I certainly want to be there to help because we're really just providing a service to help the pet and the family. Okay. So it kind of fills some of those those gaps in some of yep. those areas. Yeah. So. What would you say is probably um, as far as this need that you're because you're meeting a need in my opinion. You're 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 fulfilling a need that I think um, a lot of people don't recognize is out there. But what, what do you think is the most important thing um, that you're providing for people um, and, and their pets and their, and their, um, as they go through this process, as they think this through? And when, when should they be calling you for this? Really, there's no wrong time to call. It's when you're concerned, when you have questions, that's mm -hmm. the best time to call. Um, I feel like this is something where you just have to have a heart for working with pets and families, not being rushed. And that's really the way that I view this business is, is filling a niche that, mm -hmm. uh, that is really needed for pets and families. So when we're talking about um, in-home euthanasia, how does that cost compare with making the appointment and having to transport my, my pet to a veterinarian? Well, the costs really are quite comparable, in my opinion, to even taking your pet into the regular vet clinic. It does cost a little bit more oftentimes for um, cremation, sometimes even the actual cost of the euthanasia. And the reason why is it does take more time. It takes a lot more time just with my time getting out there, well, my sure, time, travel time even. being yeah. there with the pet and the family. Um, I try to never and, have a rushed appointment. Right, and spending as much time as they want yeah. with their pet. Absolutely, so, absolutely. Okay, and, and if somebody wants to check this out, they can go to your website and yes. we'll have that information up on, on the screen so people can get that information uh, and go to the website and get that. Um, and then as far as calling and making that appointment, I, I know cats especially, but animals tend to be rather stoic. Is it, it's better to call earlier than later? Um, as far as, especially if you know that, that your pet is failing? Most definitely, yes. Please give me a call. I can be there to offer advice, to help as much sure. as possible. But nothing breaks my heart more than when a family calls and it's, it's too it's late. It's later than it should be. Yes. Yeah. So, so the animal is probably hours or minutes away from passing right. and, and then they, they want you to be there and it's almost virtually impossible for, for right. you to do that. Right. And so that, that's not only heart-wrenching for the client who's calling, but it, it has to be very emotional for you because this is, to me, it's a service of compassion that, that you're offering yep. Uh, yep. to the family. It's a nice so, way to put it, Cheryl. So it is. sooner, sooner is, is, is always better. Yes. Um, I mean, if it's not time, it's better to, yes. you know, talk that over with you and find that, okay, you know, but these are some things that we can do. Yeah. So, um, and then the procedure that you actually do, the euthanasia, is, 
is I've had to have animals euthanized myself over the years. Is it the same for every veterinarian? Do you all have the same technique? Or? It really isn't. It really isn't. So some veterinarians won't use a sedative. Some veterina veterinarians won't use a pain reliever beforehand. That's something that I really pride myself on making this a gentle process. So it's important for me to make sure that we're doing it the best that we can. Right. Um, but certainly not every vet does do it that way. It does okay. take a little bit more time to do it that way. Okay. And and by having home in home euthanasia, we talked about, you know, it can be more comforting for the, the humans in the family, but what kind of effect, uh, I know what kind of effect it had on for me with my dog, uh, for the other pets in my home. Um, I was concerned that I had two animals that were very bonded and I wanted him to know that the other pet was gone, that he just didn't disappear. I wanted him to know that this animal had passed. And do you find that that's true with other animals in homes, that that's, that's important to give those pets that closure? I think it's so very important. I think that is a huge benefit of doing it in the home. Pets grieve just like people, and it's important to remember that. Um, I've had some pets that have actually come right alongside the other pet that is getting ready to pass on and just lay right next to them. Mm -hmm. I've had other pets that haven't, you know, and that have just acted a little bit aloof and just been in the background. But what's important to know is that your other pets do know that there's something going on because they are very smart and intuitive and this really does help them grieve and mm -hmm. just it's a lot more gentle for the other pets as well. Right. And, and I have to say um, it was almost like no one looked look for this animal after that passing. Right. Yes. Uh, it's like they knew, oh, well, he passed on. Yeah, but I, I, I think they have a, um, I, uh, my personal opinion is that they do have a, a concept of death. I think they do too. I do believe that. Mm -hmm. um, I so do I, I agree so, with that. So I think that's, that's an, another consideration, especially um, for me personally in the case where I had two animals that had been together um, the one dog had been a constant companion from 12 weeks of age on up. And, you know, I just didn't want him to th get up one morning and go, well, where'd he go? Yeah, uh, yeah. So I, I thought it was important, and it's reassuring to hear you say that it's important for those pets to have closure also. Most definitely. Okay, so, yeah. good. Joni and I both would like to really thank you for being with us uh, today on our show and being our guest and, and shedding some light on a very sensitive and subject that a lot of people, uh, again, shy away from. Um, but it's the reality of being a pet owner that we uh, need to recognize the needs of our pet right up until the very end. And so, again, thank you for all of your time. And until next time, happy, happy tales, tales to you. you.